We are fast approaching Avengers Endgame and the end of what Marvel has now dubbed the Infinity Saga. That made me want to take a look back at part one of this two-film finale and dive into the aspects that make that movie such a success. The MCU is really the only cinematic universe that has actually worked in recent memory, and I think it's worth examining why. I'm mainly going to be talking about Infinity War itself in this video, but I want to address a couple key elements from earlier films that helped to set up the success of that movie, as it would not have worked at all without the proper groundwork. So let's spend some time diving into what caused the success and acclaim of this film a decade in the making. The wisest decision the folks at Marvel Studios made was taking their time in building their universe. They started small and simple. Kicking things off with 2008's Iron Man was a pretty strong idea. The concept in that movie is extremely digestible to general audiences, and it helps that it was a pretty excellent movie in addition to that. The Incredible Hulk from later that same year seems to have been the black sheep of the Marvel film family. It seems mostly forgotten with the exception of William Hurt's General Ross who will randomly show up again years later in Civil War. I don't remember having strong feelings one way or the other towards this film, but it seems largely forgotten and not that great. I would imagine this was a point in time where there was some doubt about the integrity of this project over at Marvel due to the lackluster reception of The Incredible Hulk. It did serve the function of introducing us to the Bruce Banner Hulk dynamic that we would need to be familiar with in his next film, though. Arriving now at Iron Man 2, another lukewarm reception for early Marvel. I actually have basically no problems here, as I didn't actually know all of these extra elements were setting up the Avengers. I didn't even know about the last film's post credit scene. From that mindset, Fury and Romanoff just seem like new characters to the Iron Man series. Then you move on to Thor and Captain America the First Avenger, both strong films with distinct styles that introduce and endear their primary characters to the audience. Sure, there's a Dutch angle too many in Thor, but it's a fun movie. And then only then, after four to five films, do we see the Avengers assemble for the first time. Bringing in Joss Whedon to write and direct here was a stroke of genius, and he established many of the dynamics that have become essential pieces of the MCU to this day. Very quick side note here, Cap's suit in this movie. A lot of people like to rag on this suit for being super dumb looking, and yeah, yeah, it is. And that's why it's so perfect. The thing was designed by Coulson, who's a Captain America fanboy. I gotta say, it's an honor to meet you, officially. I sort of met you. I mean, I watched you while you were sleeping. And was designing the suit based on these trading cards in the old films. It's an armored version of this. The design is character motivated. Look past the surface just a little bit and you'll find fun and interesting things when before you may have thought it dumb. Back to the main point, though. Marvel took the time to make us care about the characters before expecting us to do so. Jumping ahead a bit, this moment, you know, this one only works because it is earned. That's why this has none of the same impact of the Thor moment. Coulson's death in the first Avengers is effective because we've seen him become increasingly important through the earlier films. This mindset is carried through the entire series. The characters come first, sometimes even at the expense of the plot. Moments like these just wouldn't resonate the same way otherwise. On to the next thing. Become part of a bigger universe. Just don't know it yet. Who the hell are you? Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Huh. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. Implementing these the way they did was incredibly brilliant. I could be totally wrong here, but I don't think there's been another series with post credit scenes as vital as the MCU's. The use of the post credit scene has allowed Marvel to sidestep one of the most irritating aspects of basically every other attempt to build a cinematic universe. The four sequel tease. Let the games begin. By moving these teases to after the credits, the movie is now allowed to tell a complete story that wraps up neatly and gives the audience a satisfying conclusion to the arc they just watched, while still giving them a little extra to get them coming back next time. It's the best of both worlds, standalone film, kind of, and franchise builder. It seems like such a small thing, but it makes all the difference. Obviously, good writing and directing are key to building to a place where something like Infinity War is even possible, but I think the success really comes down to being willing to take the time to allow that writing 
to bring the characters to life and not just rush for the money shots. At some point in the future, I'll go into real detail about the MCU as a whole, maybe taking it phase by phase, but I think it's time to get to the main event here and talk about Infinity War. Let's start with the escalation of stakes, because that's where the movie decides to kick things off. In the very first scene, longtime MacGuffin the Tesseract is shattered to reveal that it was basically just a case. The once formidable Hulk gets his ass handed to him with relative ease, supporting character Heimdall is murdered, and, most importantly, Loki, critically important villain-turned-hero, is killed while failing at his best move, deception. Not just killed, either. I mean, this is really brutal. This scene establishes just how much of a threat Thanos is, which was sorely needed as previously he had only been seen sitting in a chair. The only problem with this opening scene, and it is a big one, is that it essentially destroys the emotional victory of Thor Ragnarok for the sake of this next chapter. Maybe there will be an even more emotional climax for Thor after Endgame, but Ragnarok does feel retroactively cheapened by Infinity War as half of Thor's citizens are slaughtered here. Beyond that, though, for its purpose in this film, it's a near-perfect opener. The clearest indication of stakes, though, is, of course, the ending. I mean, you can't get much higher stakes than dissolving half of the universe. The ending here is pretty perfect. It brings us to an absolute low, which will make Endgame all the more satisfying when they do eventually defeat Thanos. I want to make a couple side points about stakes while we're here. So many people go around saying that characters need to die or be in danger of dying for a story to have stakes. And that's just such a limiting viewpoint to have on storytelling. Infinity War chooses to kill off a lot of characters, but there are many ways of generating stakes. The method a character chooses to accomplish their goal can create stakes. Introducing new quantities into the situation, maybe during a prequel, can create stakes. And the reaction of characters within the story to actions of other characters can also create stakes. Having people die is not the only way a storyteller can create stakes in their narrative, and I wish people would stop saying that it is. Also, yes... I am aware that most likely everyone who got dusted in this movie will be revived somehow. Like, we're all on the same page about that, right? That doesn't mean that this didn't create huge stakes for the next film, though. Since it's a good enough story, it manages to survive the audience having that knowledge because we care about the surviving characters. If you don't, why are you even still watching these movies? I can't imagine they're that enjoyable for you. They don't know that everyone else will be saved, and we don't know how they will be saved. Stakes. Now let's talk about Thanos. This big purple jackass and the way he is used are undoubtedly principal reasons this movie works as well as it does. To start, the movie is told from his perspective, structurally. It's an interesting storytelling move as he is narratively the antagonist, but he is the one who is on the mission we follow from start to finish. If you'll take a look, you'll notice that all of our heroes sort of pop in and out of the narrative based on where in the galaxy-spanning story we currently are. None of them are actually the main character of the story. The closest would probably be Thor, but even he isn't. Thanos being the protagonist allows for the structure of the film to not result in a jumbled mess as, otherwise, Infinity War would have been like three ensemble films crammed together and would have lacked focus. Thanos' story is relatively simple and clean and allows for all of the heroes to have their moments to shine against him. He follows the three-act structure pretty visibly. All that being said, though, he is not a good guy, and anyone who says otherwise should maybe do some moral reevaluating of themselves. I understand the Thanos did nothing wrong thing is like 99% a meme, but that other 1% of you, listen up. This is a horrendous plan. One, because it involves ending half of all life. And two, because it is at best a band-aid on a problem with infinitely better solutions. I can understand how a person like Thanos would come to the conclusion that this is a good idea. But it's kind of a horrendous and terrible plan. The film, though, never justifies Thanos' behavior. I mean, he repeatedly talks about how this is the only solution and how he's the only one willing to make the sacrifices necessary to succeed, but he's called out on how wrong his mindset is multiple times throughout the film. The universe is finite, its resource is finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correction. You don't know that! Or for a solution. Genocide. I no, you didn't. No, you didn't. I've seen some critiques of the filmmakers for referring to Thanos as empathetic, though he is clear, very clearly a bad dude. Here's the thing. A character can be both bad and empathetic, and saying someone is empathetic is not endorsing or excusing their actions. Here's the definition of empathy, at least according to Wikipedia. 
empathy is the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within their own frame of reference. That is, the capacity to place oneself in another's position. By this definition, Thanos is empathetic, which I will illustrate through two points. One, Thanos' plan can be understood as it is something that has been proposed before in our own history. It's called a Malthusian catastrophe and was a prediction posited by an 18th century economist, Thomas Malthus, and not quality dude, Thomas Malthus. The crux of this prediction was that agricultural production increases arithmetically, while population growth increases exponentially, and that eventually that would lead to a scenario where there was not enough food for everyone on the planet, causing famine to destroy society. Sound familiar? Malthus proposed various ways of population control, including delaying marriage and abstaining from procreation. Here's the thing with this prediction, though. There was another solution to the problem that Malthus did not consider, and that Thanos in Infinity War also never considers, changing outside variables. What happened that prevented Malthus' doomsday scenario is farming technology advanced, allowing food production to grow and sustain growing population numbers. As has been pointed out by many other people, Thanos very easily could have used the gauntlet to alter reality in a way that created more resources, but he was more concerned with being right than actually finding a long-lasting and positive solution. You see, Thanos is an empathetic character, but he does not possess empathy himself. Now on to point number two, where I outline how Thanos can be understood by putting myself in his shoes. Now remember, these shoes are those of someone who lacks empathy. So, first I see my planet's resources being depleted by an ever-growing population. I try and come up with a solution and decide the only way to solve the issue is to decrease the population. Not a great plan and won't permanently solve any issues, but that's the plan I come up with. Terrible, but from what we are told in the film, seems like it was the only plan produced. I am shamed for said plan and called a psychopath. My planet is then destroyed by the very thing I was trying to prevent, and I think my plan would have prevented it. Sit on that thought for let's say 500 years and decide that this line of thinking is applicable to the entire universe. Obviously, Thanos has an ends justify the means mentality, so no action he takes would be morally out of the question for him, including his treatment of Gamora and Nebula. See, Thanos is empathetic as you can understand his line of thinking, but he's basically wrong about everything. He's not a savior, he's not a martyr, and he doesn't love Gamora. He believes he does, but someone who feels love for another person would not be capable of this action. Just because Thanos spends a lot of time justifying his actions doesn't mean the film does the same. In summary on Thanos, he's a masterfully written and performed villain. He's understandable, but ultimately cold and dangerous. His philosophy of any sacrifice for the greater goal directly contradicts that of the Avengers, and I'm excited to see how they bring him down in the next film. Another ingredient to the success of this movie is the character team-ups the writers put together. This is something that the filmmakers at Marvel have mastered over the years, knowing which characters to place with which other characters to create engaging sequences. Putting the egos of Tony Stark and Stephen Strange in the same scenes practically lets them write themselves. Thor melds in perfectly with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Even the small team-up moment between Okoye, Black Widow, and Scarlet Witch is super fun. Tony and Peter's relationship continues to be a strong element to both characters, and then being in the same location allows for one of the most impactful losses of the entire film. There really isn't a misstep with regard to the placement of any character here, which is pretty magnificent considering how many there are. Even the surprise cameo by Red Skull just somehow works super well. What Infinity War achieves with its characters is kind of the peak of what franchise filmmaking can accomplish. Marvel Studios has created a full world populated by characters we all know and love. At any point, they can pull a character into a situation where they fit well, regardless of star power or anything like that. If it makes sense for a character to be present, they can show up. That's a pretty cool situation to be in. I want to quickly touch on a couple moments that I found great for visual or editing reasons super quick. This part where Spider-Man jumps back and is caught by the Iron Spider suit is just superhero gold to me. Um, the cut where we first re-encounter the Guardians of the Galaxy makes me smile every time. This entire Soul Stone quest sequence on Vormir just looks beautiful and amazing. Thor, Rocket, and Groot's adventure on Nidifalir is also an amazing spectacle. The aesthetic of Titan is pretty interesting and unique, as, as are several moments from the fight that takes place there. I love that in the Battle of Wakanda, we see things like Black Panther's purple energy blast thing just going off here and there in the background. 
Just little details the filmmakers carried over from previous films. And of course, there's this bit. Another quick thing, it's great that Marvel has started to actually value the music in their movies more than they used to. This is definitely something they should have done from the start, as character themes could have grown and evolved with the characters to a point where we would now have emotional reactions whenever that track starts coming up. There's a strong taste of that, though, with the Avengers theme and a similar feeling with the Wakanda music that adds a level of impact whenever they are played. But just imagine if Cap's theme from the first Avenger had carried forward and evolved as he did, or Iron Man's theme had done the same. I'm just glad to see that they're finally learning this lesson and integrating their music in a more profound way. One final note, the fact that the heroes get their asses kicked in this movie is marvelous. I remember when it was first announced that Infinity War would be two parts, and I got so excited about the idea that they would probably lose in the first part and have to fight their way back in the second. I love the idea of having to fight back from total defeat and making something out of nothing and was really worried when the announcement came that Avengers 4 would no longer be Infinity War Part 2 and people started running with the narrative that it would be something else entirely. I always felt that they were wrong and I cannot be happier that everyone who said that was dead wrong. It would have been such a missed opportunity to dispatch Thanos in one film and the storytelling possibilities of the path Marvel took are far more interesting. I think it's probably pretty clear that I'm hyped as hell for the closing chapter of this story. And that's it for this one. Sorry this took so long to come out, took a lot of time to think about what I wanted to say and how exactly I wanted to say it, but here we are. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, maybe give it a like or show someone else who might enjoy it. If you want to see more videos like this one, please subscribe. I make videos all the time. Anyway, that's going to do it for me this for this video. Uh, have a good one, everybody. Bye.